baptism and religion. That's not at all controversial topics that are going to get me trolled. Hi everyone, if you are new to my channel, I am Sam and I make videos about autism and neurodiversity here on YouTube every single week. If you think you might like that kind of thing, feel free to hit the subscribe button with the little bell so you get notified every time I post a new video. I'm so excited for this video, possibly because it is the first time in my life I have ever been able to use both of my degrees at the same time, and possibly the only time that I have ever used my master's degree. So if everybody could say a big thank you to John, who commissioned this video on Kofi, uh, please thank him in the comments because I think this topic is so interesting. But I would say that, I did a master's in it. As a psychology, sociology and religion nerd all rolled into one, it is going to be hard for me to restrain myself, but I will try. Of course, there are thousands of different religions, each with different practices, and so I'm going to have to generalise somewhat in this video. I couldn't possibly cover the topic as in-depth as I would like. Even within Christianity, the experience of an Anglican is worlds away from the experience of someone within the Pentecostal church, for example. So I will try my best to kind of cover everybody's experiences and collate it into one a general thesis, but um, this is not a PhD, this is a YouTube video. I am sorry to disappoint. In this video I'm going to be talking about my personal experiences of religion, um, autistic thought patterns and belief tendencies. My theory on clergy in general being an interesting occupation for autistic people historically speaking, and just about anything that I can think of related to the subject of autism and religion. I just want to say that although in real life, is this real life? I don't know. I'm a pretty sarcastic atheist, uh, but I'm not going to make glib jokes here. So if I can stop myself from making bad jokes for the duration of this video, and believe me, it's hard for me, <laughs> and you guys know I love a bad joke, um, you guys can be respectful in the comments because we have a variety of different people from different backgrounds, and just for the record, I have absolutely no interest in entering into long theological discussions in the comment, especially if you're trying to prove the existence of your God. So let's start with my personal story of my own beliefs and like the thought patterns and the thought process kind of behind them and how they developed, which I do actually find inextricably linked with my autistic thought patterns. Now my familial background is broadly sort of Lutheran on one side and Jewish on the other, but my upbringing was really done without any religion, except for some of the more cultural aspects like Christmas, which we celebrated in like a Scandinavian style, which is kind of closer to the pagan celebration than anything to do with Christianity. My immediate family was and remains quite atheist in outlook, and I think we would probably be classed from a sociological perspective as part of the nuns. You know, not like the nuns, but the nuns as in what is your religion? I have none. <laughs> Growing up I actually went to Christian schools, which is reasonably common in the UK. Um, they were sort of broadly Anglican or Church of England, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, it's sometimes thought of as kind of like a tea and biscuits religion, where mildly speaking clergy members offer you a cup of tea and a biscuit at a time of crisis. That's not necessarily true, but that's kind of like the stereotype anyway. But in primary school I remember getting very upset about religion, and that wasn't because my parents were there ranting about it. I just didn't see why we had to do it and why, in, from my opinion, everybody else was pretending. I remember one of the first days I started at primary school and we were singing hymns because we had assembly every day and um, we were singing He's Got the Whole World in His Hands and I vividly remember thinking, don't be ridiculous, nobody has the whole world in his hands. I wasn't actually that much of a literal thinker, I do know that I, I realised it was a metaphor, but it was one that didn't really make any sense to me. And that's carried on throughout my life. I find that religious people tend to explain their beliefs by using metaphors, but that doesn't really make any sense because it sounds lovely, uh, but it doesn't mean anything. But you know, as a child I was very concerned with being like a good girl, uh, something also that was emphasised by the, the kind of school that I went to, especially in primary school, and the religious aspects of that, so I, I went along with everything. Um, I was afraid not to pray or not to say grace before mealtimes, and so I basically just went along with it as a survival mechanism. Um, I was really concerned that if I didn't, if I didn't go along with it that I would really get in trouble. 
And I had the hardest time in RE or religious education classes, especially when, uh, when you're a youngster, you tend to have the same teacher for mul multiple subjects. And this is kind of poor planning on her part that she happened to do both of them on the same day because I think she was religious. But this teacher, when I was seven or eight, uh, we had history class. Uh, she was teaching us all about early man, you know, Australopith Australop Australopithecus. Australopithecus. So we were colouring in uh, all these types of early man, Homo habilis and all that kind of thing with the tools and stuff and I remember laughing because they were naked. <laughs> God, I'm a child. We were so we were told all about early man descended from the apes. And up next was RE class. Like I said, it was a very kind of coincidental thing that these two classes happened to go together, but I guess it helped me put things together a bit more clearly. And we were learning about Adam and Eve, or we were, you know, reading about Adam and Eve, the first humans. And so I was like, wait, 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 wait. Excuse me? I vivid, I really do remember being extremely confused. Not only that, it was such a blatant contradiction, but because nobody else seemed to notice. But conformity at that age certainly trumped critical thinking from a group perspective, so I was basically told to stop being disruptive with my questions. And I was very quick to see the holes in these things, like logical arguments or things that are contradictory and no one had answers that satisfied me, and they still don't, really. And, you know, I've had a lot of people try to convince me, even the most well-meaning Christian, um, they try to convince me with logic, they appeal to my logical side, but that invariably falls short, so here I am. <laughs> As a teen, I went to a school where daily chapel attendance was mandatory, and we even had a chaplain on campus um, in case of a, I don't know, crisis of faith, or, you know, if we needed some emergency mansplaining. But I really believe that my autistic thinking patterns and preference for logical thought over emotional thought. Can you have emotional thought? But that really influenced and still influences my beliefs. There is this kind of theory in cognitive psychology that there are two types of thought systems, essentially a top down versus a bottom up. And top down might be considered the quick thinking, um, making decisions rapidly based on small amounts of information and your pre existing knowledge. And bottom up is the slower, more deliberate kind of thinking that looks at all the details in more depth. Now, obviously, th that sounds a lot like kind of like neurotypicals versus autistic people, their models of thought. And I, but I don't think you can say that neurotypical people think one way and autistic people think another way because we both think both, nobody thinks one way or the other all the time, but I do think that autistic people display, tend to display preference for the bottom-up type of information processing, the detail-oriented work, the, the slower deliberation, and so it can take us to a little bit more time to process things, which is why sometimes if I'm having a discussion or an argument, I'll kind of go away and then it's only later on that I'm like, well I really would have liked to have said this because that's how I think or what I believe. But I think that if you have a tendency towards the slower deliberate thought, I think that often leads towards not necessarily just atheism, then, then definitely a more non-conformist attitude to religion. So even if you continue to have faith um, in a higher power or you continue to identify as a Christian or whatever, I think that if you favour a, a slower, more deliberate style of thinking, you more often than not tend to be more critical of the religion side of it um, and these sort of um, arbitrary rules and confines. And I have seen this within the autistic community. They might be a Christian, but they choose to practice in an unconventional way or something like that. And I don't want you to think that I believe that religious people can't be logical, but rather that for many religions, um, faith is the central part of their identity and beliefs. Once you break down a lot of their beliefs and reasoning to the core, you kind of like debunk certain evidence, you, you get out of the logic. At the end of the day, the faith aspect is what's left when you, when you strip all the, the other stuff away. And faith is believing something without evidence, because otherwise you don't really need faith. And that is seen as a virtue by many people. But this is ultimately something that I can't do and I can't feel, because it, faith is supposed to be an emotional comfort. But to me, there is no comfort in illusion. There is no comfort in just believing it because I've got to have faith. That is, it's, it feels hollow to me. There is no substance inside of the, the warm and fuzzy feeling that other people get. I don't feel that. 
And that's not even just religion. I find the whole Santa thing extremely weird. You know, I have such fond memories of my childhood Christmas and absolutely nothing of that was to do with Santa Claus or, or, or any other myth. I also find it hard to have faith in humanity, for example. I used to kind of think of myself as a humanist, and now I'm not so sure. Especially when humans repeatedly show me again and again how fickle and untrustworthy they can be. And it's not that I'm completely cynical about humans, but I am a pragmatist and a realist. And it's not that I have no imagination or emotional depth. I just derive no emotional comfort in illusion or faith. That sounded very Star Trek, didn't it? When it comes to research that has been done on this topic, autism and religion, or religious belief among autistic people, um, in my opinion, most of this has been rather fundamentally flawed. Much of it is based on the underlying assumption that autistic people have either poor theory of mind, which I take issue with, and have less of a sense of self. And therefore they are less religious because they can't see into the mind of God or something. These base assumptions really make no sense to me, and mu much of the research has been done with very small sample sizes or autistic children or arbitrarily only including high-functioning autistic people because reasons. If you do know of any good quality research on this subject, please do let me know in the comments down below. As much as I would love to do a full literature survey for every video, I just can't. Even though this is not academic research, um, a website called Autistic Not Weird, which is written by Chris uh, Bonello, he conducted a survey of over 11,000 uh, people, including autistic and not autistic people, and it indicated that autistic people do tend to be slightly less religious than non-autistic people. But interestingly, other factors really had much more of an impact. So for example, country of birth had a huge impact, gender, age, and sexuality. All of these things had as much or more to do with how religious or not religious you are as autism does. I have left a link to the survey down below as it's rather interesting and it's not just about religion, it covers all kinds of opinions that autistic people and non-autistic people have. So I wanna talk a little bit about the appeal of religion to autistic people, because even though I find myself unconvinced by the arguments put forward, and that's, you know, just my opinion, I can see why many autistic people are religious um, or why they might be drawn to religion. Many religions, if not most, have some sort of component of ritual, routine, and yearly celebrations, which give an unyielding and comforting structure. Some religions even encourage repetitive movements, which in any other situation would be recognized as stimming, but this is sort of stimming sanctioned by authority. You know, it is acceptable stimming. To just take a random example, take rosary beads. A perfect example of something that had to have been invented by somebody neurodivergent. I guess they are the original fidget toys. This is where I get someone in the comments saying, well, actually, the first recorded uh, fidget toys are date from the Shang Dynasty in China uh, 1,500 years, years ago. Blah, blah, blah. Just kidding, I love your comments. But there are also religious communities, especially in the United States, where they might talk in tongues, um, which is called glossolalia or glossolalia. I don't know, actually. These are all words that I've read many times and never said out loud, so we'll go for glossolalia. Um, an autistic person who has verbal stims might find relief that they have an outlet to do that without being judged and without being kind of othered. Ritualistic movements and sounds like chanting or prayer can be calming for a lot of people, but uh, might end up actually being a coping mechanism for autistic people, especially if their culture might try to suppress their stims in other ways, or suppress other autistic habits which might end up causing the autistic person more stress. Of course, that's not to say that everything about religion is autistic friendly and sensory friendly. Not at all. You know, many Christians uh, attend megachurches, and this is like going to a rock concert every week. And I c that, that's, not, that's not sensory friendly. Some religious communities are extremely socially intensive. Everybody is kind of like in everybody else's business and that can be very draining on us. And you might think of religion as being like a relationship between the individual and their God. But in reality, most religions are primarily social in nature, regarding communal worship, communal education or prayer. And this might be good or bad depending. One thing I was thinking was that the repetitive nature of worship or prayer can provide helpful social scripts, especially if you're someone like me that often doesn't know what to say. 
for example, saying, well, can I get a praise Jesus is an acceptable conversation starter. <laughs> I bet someone's going to tell me that's not true. But, you know, it always gives you something to talk about and you can always just revert to talking about religion and talking about your relationship with Jesus. And it's like the topic that never gets old. I'm, kind of, I, I'm sorry, I'm kind of veering towards Christianity here, but it's, it is sort of like the major religion in the, in the Western world. So that's kind of like why I'm... I'm, I'm doing it that way. I would be really interested to know any autistic people who have any insights with regards to other religions like Hinduism or Islam. Anyway, let me know in the comments, please info dump. But the central kind of thesis of this video, which I would actually really love to do a PhD about, but I got no time for that, is that I believe that historically being in the clergy actually attracted many neurodivergent people and probably suited them too. There is a weird beeping noise that I cannot figure out where it's from and it's really distracting me right now. I hope it's not going to get picked up. Now this, this thesis is sort of well developed in my mind but it's going to be hard to talk about. I'm going to have to make uh, generalizations more than I'm comfortable with perhaps. Obviously religion varies, requirements for being in the clergy vary and history varies yet also repeats itself. So just be glad this video is not two hours long right now, okay? So in addition to the stuff that I mentioned before about why religious people might actually thrive... I've worked out the source of the beeping. A car is reversing really slowly. So in addition to the stuff that I mentioned before about why autistic people might thrive in a religious environment or within a religion, I think it's worth mentioning about like historically the clergy were typically big thinkers. They were often the most educated group of people, sometimes the only one in the community who could read or write because obviously they had to, you know, interpret the scriptures. And being in the clergy also meant that you were a little bit isolated, a little bit separate from your community, but also still connected in various ways. Many religions and places of worship either have mandatory silence or really value silence, so that is also something that might have attracted an autistic person to the clergy. Depending on the constraints of your particular religion, being in the clergy might have alleviated the social pressure to have a conventional marriage, lifestyle, have children, that sort of thing. Because if you were a clergyman, you might not be able to be married, so it might be like the perfect situation for an autistic asexual person for example. If you were autistic and LGBT, but especially sort of asexual, uh, which a larger proportion of the autistic community are, then what better place to live than a convent or a monastery um, where you have no obligations to conform to the ascribed heterosexual lifestyle of the time? Um, you can be silent for days at a time without people thinking you were odd. You have a supportive, we hope, community. Um, you can learn about philosophy, you can discuss philosophy and religion. You can get into your special interests like gardening and music, as long as you're into the devotionals, I guess. <laughs> um, and the routine is strict and unchanging. Plus, you might be serving a community and doing, in your eyes, meaningful work, all of which is very important to autistic people. Now, I'm not really saying that the reality of religious institutions and being in the clergy and, and all of this is all roses and peaches and ice cream. But in theory, at least, it is a structure that may have suited many autistic people and provided certain benefits and protections. Now, the last point I want to discuss is how religion might use or abuse autistic people. So I don't want you to think from what I've said so far that I support all religious institutions and think they're just great. In case it's not obvious, religious people can commit atrocities and perpetuate abuse just as well as atheists can. So let's not even go there. I'm well aware of the abuse that has happened within religious institutions historically. It's just kind of like a different perspective on, on that. But we are talking about autism, so I will try to stay on track here. Now, even though we might be logical thinkers, for various reasons, autistic people can be susceptible to manipulation. And especially religions, new religious mo movements or cults, that use predatory behavior are especially problematic in this regard. And also, I'm not really like this with religion as a topic, but on some topics, I can easily agree with either side because I see the shades of gray in the argument. I see nothing but shades of gray sometimes. And think about the bottom-up approach to data processing that I mentioned before. 
We can get so bogged down in details that it is hard to see the bigger picture, which in this case means aligning yourself with a side. You know, you're either in the religion or you're not in the religion in a lot of cases. So I can feel sometimes, especially on complicated or nuanced topics, that I'm just kind of absorbing the opinion of the last person I spoke to, especially if they had some pretty compelling reasons or made a compelling argument because I'm not always able to step backwards at that time and see the bigger picture without more time to think and process. So it can be hard to get at my own actual opinion sometimes. And this is an educated and like, you know, in intelligent person. This is somebody that is very kind of like intellectually fierce. And if I have that problem, I imagine like most autistic people also have that problem. But if you ask me too soon after a conversational debate, I often won't know my opinion on a subject. Many religions can and do, of course, prey on the vulnerable, the isolated, and they can take advantage of this. You know, um, I'm not saying that I would necessarily get indoctrinated into a cult, but I can certainly see myself being taken advantage of by organizations, maybe not religions, but maybe other organizations that might use this sort of predatory tactics. There is one technique called love bombing, which is commonly used in some religions. And if it is used in a sexual way, it can also be called flirty fishing, which is one of my favorite terms. And this is what was practiced by the members, the female members of the Children of God cult in the 70s and 80s. It's now known as the family, I think. And the gist of love bombing basically is that the person involved makes you feel like you are the most wonderful person in the world, you are so special, and it's not just used by organisations, it can be used by abusive indiv uh, individuals. And I think personally I can be very susceptible to this, and autistic people in general can be very susceptible to this, because we're not used to feeling accepted in instantly, and we're not used to feeling welcome and like we're normal and welcome and special, especially in a group setting. And I think this can, this feeling can be really intoxicating. And while I've never joined a cult, I have been love bombed by friends in the past and the realization that their supposed affections were all a lie is incredibly painful. But if you get to the point where you are, you then like severed all other ties and moved in with either the person or with the religion, um, that's extremely dangerous and that puts you in a, a vulnerable person in an even more vulnerable position. Anyway, thank you so much for coming to my TED talk. I hope you have enjoyed this somewhat winding path through my brain on this topic and I'd be really interested to continue a discussion, a civilized discussion, in the comments below. Um, but let's not have a theological debate about the existence of God, please. My god, please. Thank you again to John Holmes for commissioning this video. If you want to commission a video on a specialist topic that requires a little bit more research and a bit of a deep dive, um, please head to my Kofi profile and you can click the commissions button. You can also join my brand new Discord server. So many of you asked, are you going to have a chat room or a Discord or whatever? So I set up a Discord server because, I don't know, it's fun, I guess. <laughs> you can join us for a small monthly fee. Um, the details are all in the description box and basically we are building a fantastic community and you will have access to exclusive bonus content, perks, giveaway, um, merch maybe. Uh, so a big shout out to the people who've already joined. I'm really enjoying chatting with you and I hope we can build something really cool and really exciting. If you like this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and do all the social media engagement stuff. Hope you enjoyed this topic. I know Storm did, and I'll see you next time.